Hello. So uh, I'm Mike. I want to let you know that I am going to be talking about heat pumps for the most part and mostly about uh, my experience with converting to a heat pump. Uh, I, as Nicholas said, I am a solar ambassador, have been for several years, and I'm on the board of ICA. And I am not an installer of HVAC equipment. <clears throat> uh, I am a geeky engineer that loves solar energy and wants to uh, electrify my home. So I'm gonna talk to you about my experience. I'm gonna talk a little bit about electrifying everything. Why should we do that? Is it even possible? And some of them are gonna be easy <clears throat> and some of them are not so easy. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I'm gonna talk about heat pumps. There's lots and lots of different types. I'm gonna focus on air-based heat pumps uh, for this presentation because that's my story. That's what I know the most about. And I think we'll cover some really important things for you to consider. I'm hoping that uh, everybody on this call maybe has an opportunity to convert to an air-based heat pump or another type of heat pump. And I hope that this really helps you in that decision-making process. Again, this is put on by ISCA. I hope that a lot of you are members of ISCA. Um, membership really helps us put on these programs and help spread the news about solar energy and about electrifying and how this can uh, help make our air cleaner, our health better, and uh, help us feel good about uh, our relationship with uh, nature. And with this Earth Week, I'm really happy to uh, be here to talk about it. So why electrify everything? Well, this Earth Week, hopefully we're all thinking about, is there a better way or better ways that I can be a citizen of this planet? And if you look at this chart on the left, this has uh, greenhouse gas emissions for the U.S. in 2019, of which there were a lot. So why electrify everything? Well, we can reduce those emissions. When we reduce those emissions, it improves the environment, it improves the health for us and all the other creatures on the planet. And why to do it? Well, because we can make clean energy, renewable energy, uh, wind and solar. Of course, got a big, a big fan of solar. We can store energy. We know how to do that now. We know how to improve the grid to help manage uh, the fact that when we produce renewable energy, it's not all going to come exactly when we need it. So we can store it. We have ways to manage demand. We can decentralize that grid to make it much more re resilient. Another reason to uh, electrify everything is that we like our energy. So the other alternative is we just stop using energy. That's not a great alternative. So if you look at this graph, this pie chart on the left and think about what can I do at my house? Well, there's actually quite a bit that you can do. So, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about electrifying transportation. So we can get, EVs, right? Uh, we can electrify that. Our electricity, we can address that. Hey, go solar. And think about in our homes, all the energy we use there. So we're going to talk about several of those things. Some are really easy to do. Some are kind of moderate and some are more difficult. I'm going to talk about mostly one of them that's really difficult and that's HVAC systems. So Thinking about electrifying our homes is a really important way that we can help electrify everything and reduce uh, emissions in the process. So here's a few things um, that I've done and some of them are easy and some are hard. So going with uh, lawnmowers, that's pretty easy to do. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about a little bit more about lawnmowers in a second because they kind of hold a special place in my heart. Things like snowblowers, pretty easy. And then there are some things that are a little more difficult, like getting an EV. It's like, okay, I can buy an EV, but how am I gonna charge it? And then one that's really kind of hard is going to heat pumps. So again, I'm gonna talk mostly about air-based heat pumps. So some of these things are really easy, some are harder. So the easy ones, Anything that you use outdoors, think about lawnmowers, snowblowers, trimmers, rototillers, blowers, chainsaws, all those little things that you may use uh, in your yard, those are all definitely electrifiable. And it's pretty easy. You just can go out and buy it and start using it. Not a whole lot to it. Some of them, I would say, are easy to moderate. 
depending on what you have in your home already for energy. So thinking about vehicles, if you have a, an electric vehicle, uh, now it's about three, three years ago, I bought a Chevy Volt. Um, I started charging and just plug it in the 110. But eventually I'm like, that's kind of slow. So I put two 240 volts out in my garage. Well, I couldn't just go and do that like that. I had to get an electrician to do that. I had to make sure I had the amperage out there that I needed. So you might need 50 amps or higher. I put in a hundred amp service to my garage. Inductive ovens, those have gotten really good, but you may also need to put in 240 volt service and 40 to 50 amps um, as well. Clothes dryers, water heaters, same kind of thing. You may have to put in 200, 40 volt service. Good news about this is in addition to the, the ones that you, are very common, that uh, like if, uh, clothes dryers, if you go to a uh, Home Depot, they've been there for years, electric ones. Um, there is also heat pump versions of dryers. So think about if, hey, I have gas. If I wanna go to electric, that's great. If I wanna go to electric, but really use a lot less energy, I could go to a heat pump dryer. So those are here now. They've been around Europe and they've been in Asia for a long time. They work really well. They're just coming to the States, maybe for the last, I don't know, three or four years. Um, but you can get them at Home Depot and other places too. Don't want to plug any one, one place. Water heaters, same thing. You could get electric water heater, put in 240 volt service, and it's going to use a good amount of electricity. Or you could put a heat pump water heater in it's gonna use a lot less electricity. So that's the nice thing about those two options. Uh, may take a little bit of work, uh, but there's heat pump versions, which even reduce the electricity draw compared to conventional uh, electric clothes dryers or water heaters. Uh, then there's the difficult category. And that's what we're gonna talk about uh, tonight. And that's heating, HVAC. Um, when I tell you my story, you'll see why it's not, you just can't go out to the store and pick up one of these things. There's a lot of things to consider. And I think that's gonna be some of the main things I wanna to convey to you is what are those things to consider? A beautiful thing about all this is you can power all of this with clean energy from the sun. All right, I have to talk a little bit about lawnmowers. Um, I told you I'm a geeky engineer and I worked at Briggs & Stratton when I was, uh, actually when I was in college back in the 80s. And so I love lawnmowers, I love everything, riding, push, everything. And while I was there, that's when they developed their first electric motor for lawnmowers. But the gas-powered ones are pretty nasty. So if you see on the left side of this picture, they pollute. You got VOCs, you got nitrous oxides, carbon dioxide, particulate matter, bad stuff. So on the left side, a lot of bad stuff, it pollutes. Um, on the right side, it pollutes a lot. 5% of our pollution is from gas mowers. Um, that second bullet, one gas mower running for an hour emits the same amount of pollutants as eight new cars driving 55 miles per hour for the same amount of time. Who would have thought that? That would hopefully convince me if I didn't already have an electric mower to get an, an electric mower. And think about waste. Think about filling, I haven't filled a lot more, but I remember doing that and I would spill gas, right? Well, over 17 million gallons of gas are spilled each year, refueling equipment. That's more than was spilled by the Exxon Valdez. Um, so we waste a lot of it. And think about, so most gas mowers are four cycle engines. Some of them are two cycle engines. Uh, as it turns out, in California, I don't believe you can get a two-cycle lawnmower engine anymore. That They've been banned, which is great. And that last bullet, think of a small little leaf blower, a commercial brand, so it's pretty good. One hour of operation emits small forming pollution comparable to driving a Toyota Camry about 1,100 miles, approximately the distance from Los Angeles to Denver. These two-cycle engines are awful. They're loud, they're noisy, and if you've been operating one, had to breathe. think about all the people that operate those commercial 
blowers for several hours a day. Um, I'm glad I don't have to do that. So gas powered mowers, not a good thing. The good news is that there are a lot of great electric mowers available. That's mine on the screen. The advantages I'm listing here for lawn mowers are the same advantages for all those other outdoor pieces of, po of power equipment that people use. Uh, and the disadvantages are the same as well. No gas, no oil, low maintenance. So it's not no maintenance, it's low maintenance. They are much more quiet than their gas counterparts. Low vibration. So for me, and I uh, told you I worked at Briggs and Stratton, I became a big fan of John Deere when I was there because we were testing all the mowers and all the decks and everything. John Deere made him right. So we had, before this, before electric, this is our second electric, um, we had a John Deere, top of the line, excellent, wonderful. But when I would cut the grass afterwards, my hands would be a little numb because of all the vibrations from that motor, one piston going back and forth. So less vibration, my hands feel a whole lot better operating it. No pollution. You can fold it up and stand it on end. So I should have had a picture of that, but it folds down, you stand it up. Can't really do that with something that's got oil in it or gas. Uh, it's a lower cost to operate. So if you look at the electricity it takes to charge the batteries compared to the gas, it's a lot cheaper to operate. The only disadvantage is, is you got it needs batteries and you have to charge them. Uh, so again, this holds for all of those outdoor pieces of equipment. Um, that again, I would say in general are the easiest things to do if you want to electrify. And another benefit is that your neighbors will be very happy when you go electric. And so I, uh, we have an electric snowblower and my neighbors, most of them have snowblowers. Um, they're all gas. And we sometimes cough because of the fumes that come five or six houses down and blow by our house. And they're extremely loud and they wake people up in the night. So uh, your neighbors will appreciate you when, when you go electric. I don't know that my neighbors have told me they appreciate me going electric, but I'm just going to think they do. All right, so let's talk about heat pumps. A very important thing about heat pumps is they don't, they don't make heat. They move heat. That's a pretty cool thing. They don't make heat. They move heat. Uh, there's a wide variety of ground source heat pumps. There's different fries. There's a more than addition to these. So a lot of times with these closed loop systems, there are coils. So they don't go real deep into the ground. Or there might be a, a vertical system that might go 150 feet down into the ground. So those these vertical ones you see here, they might be 150 feet into the ground. It all depends. Uh, so th those are just two types. There are more than those two types. Then there's air-based heat pumps. And there are some that are used for whole home homes. And that's what mine is. I have duct work. And so this plugs into the, utilizes, I, I should say, the ducts. Um, there are other types that are mini split ductless. So this is where you'll see an outdoor unit here. And then this will be inside of the rooms. Um, so you may need uh, a few of these units. So it's not a whole home uh, setup. There's exhaust air heat pumps where they use exhaust air, air to help heat. Um, I'm not gonna, I don't have a picture of that one. Um, this one here that you see is actually a, a solar assisted heat pump. Um, there are water source heat pumps. And there are also hybrid heat pumps that combine water and air. So there are so many variety of heat pumps. And like I said, there's heat pumps for dryers. There's heat pumps for water heaters. Uh, these are really great because they move heat. They don't make it. And so they're not going to be uh, at the, that source uh, creating pollution and so forth. So we're going to dig into the whole home, whole home air-based heat pumps. There's a couple of varieties here. Um, the standard split system um, would be where you don't have a furnace. So you would have uh, the heat pump that both cools and heats the home. And you may have a backup for when it's really cold. Um, 
that makes heat. So mostly you're going to be using this move heat. There'd be some coils that they stick in, on the inside that will, when it's really cold, they heat them up. It's 100% efficient. So whatever energy you put into it as electricity, you get out as heat, um, but it uses a lot of electricity. So this is not what I chose to do. Um, there are a few reasons uh, why I did that that I'll talk about as I, I tell you a little bit more about my story. Um, but that is definitely an option. And then there's the dual fuel approach or hybrid heat. It could be called either one of those things. It's where you have a heat pump for heating and cooling. It moves heat. And then when it's really cold or if there's some failure, um, you have a furnace. And that's what I have. And that, that furnace makes heat. So those are the two typical ones for air base that would be for residences that leverage the ductwork that is already in your house. All right, so how they work. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this in a lot of detail. They work like your air conditioner. They look, work like your refrigerator, but air conditioner is probably a better way to think about it. Um, it just goes in both directions. So there's a couple additional parts. So there's a diagram here on the left. Um, so we've got the, um, the air outside is, is warmer and the gas is coming in. There's an expansion valve, which allows uh, the liquid to expand, which it makes it cool down. Now it's ready to cool your house. It goes through a coil in the furnace. With that air blowing on it, you get that cool air. As it's uh, being heated up by that fan, you get some evaporation. And this compressor compresses that gas. And when it does that, it gets hotter. And it goes out into this coil. And there's a fan here as well. So in air conditioning mode, that fan would be right here. And it blows on that. So the heat is moving from the inside of your house to the outside of your house. And then that cycle just keeps going this way. And when it gets cold, all it does is it reverses. It does the same thing. So it would be like in the, with an air conditioner, I might call this outdoor unit um, a condenser. But here it's the outdoor unit and there's an indoor unit because they serve both functions. A key thing here that's different is that there are some controls that change that direction to go from cool mode to heat mode. And the other thing that's really important is that there is a function here to defrost. So think about uh, like in the winter when it's below freezing and you are taking heat from the outside. So it might be 20 degrees. So I, mine switches over at 20 degrees. So it's 25 degrees say. My heat pump is taking 25 degree air extracting heat from it and then moving that to my house what it leaves in the outside is even colder air and that can create some frost and freezing which is not a good thing so the heat pump monitors that and on occasion it's going to need to go into frost mode and so those are the two things you've got a, a valve to switch the direction and then you have uh, some equipment there to manage uh, the frost when it gets really cold. So those are the main differences between the unit that's outside that would normally be like an air conditioning, central air, um, versus if it's a heat pump. So you might be thinking, well, shoot, why don't we just put heat pumps in all the houses instead of air conditioning units? I think that's a great question. I think, I think it'd be great if all the manufacturers said, you know, we're just going to put heat pumps uh, when we install air conditioners, and it'll do both uh, because there's not a whole lot different about it. And if we can heat your house, sweet. And you're going to see um, with my house that it can do most of the heat. All right. Again, just a reminder, feel free to put some questions in the chat as they come up. Some benefits about heat pumps, they're very efficient. They're moving heat. They're not making heat. So they can be very efficient. Um, with that efficiency, 
uh, comes some comfort, not just because it's efficient, but you get some benefits with comfort. They're really good about retaining moisture in the winter. So where we live, like in Northern Illinois, I don't know if there might be some people in Southern Illinois. I just know up here in Chicagoland, it gets pretty cold. And the air can be really dry if you have a gas forced air furnace. Well, the nice thing about these is they retain the moisture. They don't dry it out like a gas forced air furnace is. And what I got to experience this because we have a humidifier in our system, but when they installed the heat pump and the new furnace, they did not connect the humidifier. So the first winter, we did not have our humidifier running and we really didn't notice it that much. Now this past winter, we noticed it and we checked it and like, hey, the humidifier is not working. Um, so, but that to me was huge. That really made the point that it's going to be a lot easier to keep things more moist uh, in the winter than before. Uh, now variable speeds is, is available on air conditioners as well. Um, but having that variable speed, um, so my old uh, furnace and air conditioner basically had two speeds on and off. So now this system goes from 40% to 100%. And so you can maintain a tighter temperature range. And really when we think about um, an HVAC system, that's what we're really buying, right? We're buying comfort and we're buying quality air, right? So um, having that flexibility, that uh, variable speed really lets you keep a tighter range of temperature and therefore comfort in the home. Now, Reducing the carbon footprint comes even if I didn't have solar because it's, it's much more efficient. But when you think about uh, having solar, now I'm converting from using gas to using electricity that's provided by the sun. So it really has a nice impact on a carbon footprint. And again, no fossil fuels, no fumes. So again, I'll make that point. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if all the manufacturers said, you know what, we're just gonna install uh, heat pumps. You don't really need an air conditioner. We'll just give you heat pumps. There may be some situations where that doesn't hold, but definitely I think in Illinois, we'd be getting by just fine with just heat pumps, no air conditioners. All right, for me personally, thinking about converting from a, a furnace to a heat pump, some things for me to think about. Uh, I have a solar array. I am on hourly pricing. So when I use electricity matters, and I also think about what can I do to help the grid? One of the nice things about going solar is that you can help the grid. Um, so that's one of my considerations. Uh, variable speed again, reduces the peak demand in summer. So the peak demand in summer that I would have with my old air conditioner was about 10 and a half kilowatts. And now the most I ever had this in the past two summers is three kilowatts. So think about if I'm on hourly pricing, the prices go up in the summer and my system, if it's sunny on a hot day, I'm producing way more than three kilowatts. So uh, on those high price days, um, I'm not taking a hit in terms of the capacity charge that I get uh, for, for an annual basis. So that was a big deal. The other thing is since I have solar, this thing sits in the backyard, my solar panels are right above that. That outdoor unit is right below that array. And so there's gonna be large quantities of snow falling it from two stories up. So the lowest point on the reef, roof is like 17 and a half feet and it goes higher from that. So that snow can get a nice momentum uh, coming down. And it, I don't know what the top of my roof is, but anyway, it's a long way to fall. So that's a lot of impact. And so I'm going to have to protect it because in with my air conditioning unit, it's not running, but I'm going to have fan blades running like that. And there's a little protective cover on here, but it's not really enough. So I'm going to have to protect that. That's an important, very important consideration. The last one is also really important. And this is one that uh, a lot of contractors may not uh, be aware of or bring up or consider themselves. Uh, so this is a really important thing. I'm gonna have a drawing later. I'm gonna show you some more about this, but oversizing the heat pump. 
meaning a contractor is going to come in and say, you need a 310 unit or 410 unit. I might say, give me the five. And so I'll talk to you a little bit about why I did end up oversizing the heat pump. It can give me more heat capacity in the winter when it's cold, can reduce the overall consumption of electricity as well as the peak demand. And I should put on there and it's gonna reduce my gas usage. All right, so let, let me just pause there. I see there's a couple of questions. Oh yeah, so uh, Kitty's great question. Will you have to upgrade your breaker in the house? Yeah, potentially, yes. Uh, so I'll just tell you, when I um, put this service in my garage for 244 for the, um, for the one car, it was kind of thinking ahead, okay, I'm going to have hopefully two. Um, and so if that's 100, um, 100 amps service, and I may... I, I basically, with solar and some of the other things, I've used up almost all the 40 spaces in my panel. So I may have to get an upgrade. If you have 100 amp service, you may have to upgrade a 200 amp service for sure. Um, so it's very possible that you may have to change your service. How big should it be? Um, that's a good question. I think. I'm, I'm not have to, gonna have to get anything more than 200 amp service um, with a couple electric vehicles and the solar, which is, is uh, feeding in, it's a 50 amp breaker feeding into my uh, panel. So 200 amps should be plenty, I think. Oh, so Sharon, yours, yours doesn't slide off. My pitch is 26 and a half degrees. So that makes a difference. So it's going to slide. So it's kind of, I have a west facing roof, 26 and a half degrees. I wish it was less, but the, the I guess the one plus is that the snow slides off. Um, so maybe you have a, a less uh, steep pitch on your roof. And if, again, if it's like two stories up, definitely do not recommend uh, doing anything to try to get that snow to come down. That That's why I say just, Optimize for the summer. Yes. So Ryan's asking about control over the heat pump versus in natural gas. Yes. Yeah. So Ryan, I'm going to show you a, a, a drawing that shows about the, what happens to the efficiency of the heat pump um, when you uh, when it gets colder. So I'm going to come back to that one. All right, let's keep going. This is a big question for me. How much of my heat do I think I can get from a heat pump? So in things of looking, looking at this, I would just tell you when I talk to contractors, I would ask them that question. Um, they didn't have great answers. So I sharpened my pencil and I did some estimates and I can tell you what I've, what I've had so far. But that was the bit, that's the big question. I want 100%. That was what I was looking for. So here's my story. I told you remember, there's the easy, easy to moderate and the hard. So here's the hard. Um, I had this uh, kind of 10 year plan to try to electrify everything. And part of it is looking at the, the building. And when I get a little bit further, I'm gonna come back to what are the factors? So this is just some of the action. So we uh, had this spec home, it was new, built in 2001. You know, those kind of homes, they don't put the great windows in and they don't necessarily always install them real well. We had in the winter frost buildup, we had drafts. I'm like, this is a new house, it's really drafty. So we replaced the windows that we were around most, you know, that we was the biggest issue for us. We replaced about a third of our windows in 2011. We added solar in 2012. So if you think about what a lot of times people would say, I didn't do this in the, in the the order they would recommend, although I wouldn't do it any other way. It was right to do windows right away. But the energy audit, I highly recommend. That's, that, that's a great first step, do an energy audit. Out of that, we learned where we needed to address some areas. So sealing, insulating is a really important thing to do. This is a really important thing to do before you get a heat pump. Um, because 
all these things factor into it. And I would tell you to make the best, get the best performance out of a heat pump, you need to have a well-sealed house. So we did that in 2013. And then we knew we were going to replace more windows. We still had lots of draft. Um, and we were going to do that in 2014, put more windows in, more good windows that were actually sealed and worked. So we knew that when we did that, we would not have enough fresh air in the house. One of the things that's really important, um, whoever does your energy audit, don't have them do it if they're not going to do a blower door test. The blower door test is a very important thing to do uh, to let you know really where the leaks are coming. It was phenomenal. Um, so that was really important. So we knew we were going to need some fresh air. So we put in um, an ERV. What's going to whenever the 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 blower for for the air or heat is running, it's going to bring in a mix of fresh air. So we then, once we had that, we updated some more windows. Then we're like, okay, we're on this path. I learned a lot about solar. This was the first array that we put in for a little over four kilowatts. I'm like, okay, this is working great. We need more. And so we put in the other array over here. And now we're like, okay, what's the next thing? Heat pump. So I started investigating heat pumps. I learned some really important things. Not only do we need to seal the envelope of the building, we need to seal the ducts themselves. There's lots of losses. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. So first we had to clean them, and then we sealed them. So th this is a really important step to take, I think, if you're going to um, get a heat pump. If you don't, it's still a really good thing to do. And I'll show, you'll see some data. I'll show you why in a little bit. So now we're ready to get to the heat pump and we install that in 2019. Important things here, all the actions that are on this list had an impact on the heat pump performing well. Everything except for the solar, but those were all good things to do. So you see why this is not the easy thing. You go to the store and get it done. It's definitely not call it, a contractor and have them come in and install one either. So this is the system we went with. It's a carrier, Infinity. At the time it was top of the line. Now there's a better, better one out there. So it goes up to 20.5 SEER. So that SEER, think of that as efficiency to cool. They have a new one out there that's now 24 SEER. So it's much more efficient. Um, but on the heating side, which is the main consideration for me, how well can it heat? Uh, the new one is still has this HSPF of 13. That's the heating season performance factor. Basically, how efficiently can it heat? So it's got that, it's the same. One of the things I really liked about this system is that it, it was very quiet. And I will tell you that when I'm out there sitting, it's right on our patio in the back and it's extremely quiet. My neighbors are much louder than mine. So it's very quiet. I mentioned this before, it's variable speed. So it goes from 40% to 100%. Um, both the, the furnace does the same thing. And the furnace is 97% efficient. And I've got some rebates. So a $400 rebate for the heat pump and $50 rebate for the, uh, the motor. So having a variable speed motor, there's rebate on that. Again, it was installed in July of, of 2019. So that's what we have. Pretty good one. Pretty high. You know, I wanted a high end because I wanted to reduce gas usage as much as possible. There are lower lines that cost less, um, but I wanted to reduce the gas as much as possible. All right. So back to the energy audit. Uh, ComEd and Ameren, depending on what territory um, you're in, they both will do audits. Uh, ComEd is doing virtual or in-home because of the blower door test. I would really recommend uh, in-home so you get that blower door test. You'll find out where all the leaks are. Um, they also have, when they do that audit, they give you free products. So these are some of the things they'll come in and, and replace for you. They also have discounted products here. Um, and you get a personalized report from both uh, ComEd and Ameren. 
And then if you live within a co-op or a municipal utility, you'll have to check out their websites. A lot of them have really good programs as well. And I will say a lot of them have better rebates than ComEd or Ameren as well. But that energy audit gives you an idea of the envelope, the building envelope and what you can do to improve it. So, and it's free. Um, so I highly recommend that you do that. Um, ERV, boy, what does that mean? Uh, that's good. Somebody help me out with ERV. Uh, I think the V is ventilation. Um, I'll tell you what it does. It, so when the, the blower motor runs, it pulls in air and it, 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 the way it's set up, it'll um, kind of preheat or pre-cool the air. So it's not uh, like you're adding super cold uh, air in the winter or super hot air in the summer. Um, but I forget what the E and the R are. There we go. Heat recovery ventilator. That is what I mean, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah, and that's why I said that last part is describing uh, that heat recovery. Thanks, Kevin. All right. I mentioned that in addition to having the external envelope sealed, you also need to have the ductwork sealed. So this to me is, I think, an important takeaway. So think about this. If you have leaky ductwork and you have a super awesome, efficient air conditioner or furnace, you're going to waste a lot of that efficiency. So if you're going to spend a lot of money, you spend more money for efficiency. If you have leaky ductwork, you're heating the walls. You know, you're not heating the space. The idea with heating and cooling is that, you know, I've got a desk right here. When I touch that desk, it's not going to freeze my hand, right? I want to heat that desk. I don't want to heat the walls. So uh, as it turns out, when people put in ductwork, they don't really see them very well. So look at this. If you have like the best air conditioner you could possibly get, 24 sear is really good. But you're going to have leakage in your duct work. So even if it's like the best you could have, it's going to knock that down, that efficiency down to 23.3. Well, then we say, well, what if we have leakier duct work? Well, if it's 10% leakage, that goes to 20.3. 20% leakage, which is extremely common, 16.6. 30% leakage, you're, be, you're saying, you got to be kidding me. How could a duct leak 30% of the air? It's extremely common. So now that 24 sear unit becomes 12.9. And so I looked at sealing, and there's a company called AeroSeal. They're kind of the probably the, the only game in town. Maybe there's another game in town. I, I did this a couple of years ago. Um, but they come in and they seal the duct. It's pretty amazing technology. So if I would write down AeroSeal, check it out. Uh, it's awesome. So this is just the supply data. So think about the supply data. How leaky was it? And think about my blower for this What for, was rated at 2000 CFM. That's what it was supposed to deliver. But you know what? It only delivered 1400 CFM. And of that 1400 CFM, a lot of that was going out in the walls. So it was not cooling the space or heating the space the way it should. And so we were cold in the winter and hot in the summer when we shouldn't be. So in it, we started at 1,400. Then I had almost 450 CFM lost due to leakage. So now that big blower that's supposed to do an awesome job is not doing a very good job. So it was equivalent of, what's it say, about six, uh, I don't get it. About 85 square inch hole in the ductwork, 85 square inch hole in my ductwork. That I'm losing all kinds of efficiency there. So this is a really important thing to do because guess what? Heat pumps, they don't, they're not gonna send as much air out. 
Uh, and the, it's gonna it, well, it's mainly it, it's gonna be like in the in the winter, you get that burst of really warm air. You go over the vent; it's really warm. It, the temperature is not gonna be quite as high, um, and that's another reason why it's nice to have that modulation because it's gonna run more, um, but it's gonna keep your your environment just fine. But leakage is a heat pump performance killer. So this is a really important thing to do. So using that aero seal technology, you could see that I had this loss here of about 450 CM loss, CFM loss, and they run this. This is the piece of equipment right here. And they're putting these little small little pellets. It's sort of like platelets. It's like platelets for your duct work. And you could see that it drops down over time and sealed it up. I got to tell you, it was amazing. The difference from before to after, it was like I had a new HVAC system because I could hear the air coming through. I could feel it up at, you know, four, four feet tall. I'm like, holy cow. It's like I got a new, new system. This is an excellent thing. And uh, it's an important thing to consider if you're going to get a heat pump, seal the ducts. All right, I see there's a comment on CO2. Yeah, and again, that's important to make sure you get fresh air. A um, little bit on incentives. I mentioned the incentives that I had. Um, it's kind of interesting that they used to have the rebates for uh, heat pumps on their websites, but now they don't. They want you to they kind of want you to go through the contractors. And actually, I talked to my contractor today to say, hey, what, what are they now? And he has to check because actually ComEd pays the suppliers to the contractors. Um, so, oh, so you're not going to be able to find it, but I, what, what I was told is they're about the same. Um, and I will tell you that I could have had a higher rebate, but when I oversized my system that's why i got a slightly lower rebate but it was it's so worth it and i'll tell you about that a little bit but look at this if you're in a municipal utility if you're in the corn belt i'm sorry co-op this is a co-op corn belt is a co-op they're in a lot of counties in the in illinois they give you a 1500 rebate for a heat pump that is outstanding and uh, i see the question about the approximate cost of the aero duct ceiling service um, it's about 2000 bucks. I think they're the only one in town. And so they kind of, uh, it's about 2000 bucks. Now, what I would say, I didn't do this. I learned a lot. So, um, if you find there are some contractors that will clean your ducts, seal your ducts and install a heat pump for you. Um, there's probably not a lot of them that do that, but you'll get a discount if you find that contractor that can do all three of those. So they'll kind of give you a package deal. So that would be my recommendation. Find a contractor that can do all three and you'll save some money. All right, so you get some rebates. The important thing is sizing it. And so in Illinois, we have two different climate zones, zones four and five. With zone five, that would say you need a high efficiency heat pump. And if you're like me and want to get rid of, I want to, I would love to unplug the gas line. You're definitely going to need to go with a high efficiency one. Zone four, you may not have to go with the same efficiency level. And in zone four, you may be able to do, like I have this, now that I know, actually I know I could get, get by without a furnace here, which is pretty cool. In zone four, if you're in the lower half of Illinois, there's a good chance you could, I mean, get by with uh, just a heat pump and no furnace, which would be pretty neat. So part of uh, uh, picking the right heat pump is where do you live? So climate zone is important. The other thing is the building envelope. I've already been talking about that. Um, so we got to make sure that the, out, the building envelope is sealed. You have some good insulation because we're going to look at what's the heat load and what's the cooling load. Um, so think about what's the building envelope I got to deal with. I'm gonna show you, this is just part of the analysis. And this is an important thing too. Um, I, I went to three contractors. They all gave me an analysis. 
I had told them beforehand that I had done some additional things. They gave me the, the boilerplate analysis and it said, um, I needed a certain system, which I didn't really need. So, so I've, I gave them my data. Um, so they looked at things like, uh, the wind, whoa, sorry about that. The windows. So if you see, and the walls and the floors and the ceilings, all these things here, they take into account what heat are you going to lose through the walls? What heat are you going to lose through the windows? All those things, they take that onto consideration. So there's the windows. So I gave them the U values, basically what the quality of the window, what it's going to use. I gave them those heat values. And then they came down and said, okay, you don't have as much of the heat load or the cooling load as the standard ballpark bullet plane estimate. So um, I would recommend, again, if you follow these things that I just talked to you about, you can have the real data. So the information on duct loss, um, when they first gave it to me, was way off. Um, so it's going to impact. So here's what they're going to tell you. I just, um, if I had a, uh, I think I had a four ton air conditioner, much less efficient. And so it was like, we're going to put the basic information in here. You're going to need a four ton. I had done a whole lot of things to the house. Um, so actually in the, in the end of the an analysis, I could have had a three ton, but I went with a five ton. <laughs> I'll show you why. But it helps if you have the right inputs, if you want to get the right outputs. So sizing is really important. Um, with a conventional HVAC, you do not want to oversize. Since I had done all this efficiency stuff, the furnace and the air conditioning I had became oversized. And so we had big swings in temperature, not good. I didn't have that 40% to 100% flexibility. It was on or off. So I'm so glad that that's gone. But get the right information. So this information here, the infiltration, that's about how well is your house sealed. The blower door test will tell you that. So I had all that information. I gave it to them. They could give me a better idea over here of what are the real heating loads. And then they could say, this is the system that's gonna be right for you. So they gave me that system. And then I said, okay, great. On the furnace, I'm cool. On the heat pump, I want to oversize it. So I know we're, uh, so I'm gonna talk a little about, when you have a furnace and a heat pump, there's a point in time where it's your temperature that instead of heating the house with the heat pump, I need to heat it with the furnace because it's just too cold out there. So what is that point? So we need some data points here, the heating load of the house at the 99% design temp. So all that stuff that was on that prior slide, you take all that information and say, all right, what's gonna be the heating load um, at the 99% design temp, which I think is zero degrees. What's the heating capacity at 17 degrees? What's the heating capacity at 47? And what's the temperature of the heating load of the house is zero. So you take those points. And so you see right here, you see there's two lines. And where they cross, that's the balance point. That says that's the temperature at which the heat pump can keep up with the heat loss. They can generate heat. They can keep up with what the house is going to be losing. and so. Where that intersects, we come down, and in this case, it's 25 degrees. And so you can set the system that says, all right, when it's below 25 degrees, I'm going to switch over to the furnace. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. This is going to determine what percent of the time I'm running on, I'm heating with the heat pump versus heating with the furnace. So I took my data. And this is where I, there was a question earlier about uh, efficiency. And so this system can run 40% to 70%. 
I'm going to focus on the heating part. There's the same thing for cooling, but I'm just going to focus on heating. And here's the question. Where should we set the system to change from heat pump heating to furnace heating? And so we take that heating load. And so this is one of those points here. And then the, the point here is what temperature can the house just be stable? I didn't know that. So I kind of guessed by looking at some of the days, I was kind of feeling, when is the heat going to turn on? When is there enough insulation? So I was thinking a little bit aggressive. Um, so this, is, this says 50 here. I said, it's going to be between 50 and 60. It's probably more like 60. And so um, these ended up being the four points and the lines that I, I went with here where they intersect, if you come down, it's pretty similar. It was about 24 degrees. So me, I want to try stuff out. So we set that switch over at 20 degrees. I'm like, hey, I want to test this out, see what it can handle. So hopefully that makes some sense because I want to get as much of the heat from the heat pump as possible. So if I set it at 20 degrees, what percent can I get from the heat pump? And will it do it okay? And when it does the defrost, is it, are weird things going to happen? Guess what? No weird things happen when it goes on to frost. Uh, it works fine. So what I got, because I went a little aggressive, instead of 24 degrees, have it switch at 20 degrees, I have more heating from the heat pump um, overall. So hopefully that makes sense. Oh, so the efficiency. Why I went with oversize? Because when the heat pump is running here, it's more efficient than when it's running here. So if I would have had a, a four ton, uh, I went with a five ton, if I had a four ton, the most I'd be able to get out of it would look something like that. So if I did that, that curve would put me higher than 24 degrees. So I would be running it less on heat pump. I'd be running it more on the furnace. So that's why I wanted to oversize because I can create more heat at lower temperatures. It's less efficient, but I got solar. I'm okay with that. But overall, I got less of a rebate because of that. I'm okay with it because I wanted to get as much heat as possible from the heat pump. So someone had a question, and I'm hoping that answered your question. Why do, over, why do you want to oversize it? Because I can run it at lower temperatures, get a higher percentage of my heat from the heat pump, use less natural gas overall. And if I have solar providing electricity, hey, no big deal if it takes a little bit of a hit on the efficiency. It works fine. It's going to defrost a little bit, but... I've got two, two winners of it, no problem. All right, so hopefully that answered that question. So the results. So natural gas impact. I've got three years here. I can, I'm pointing out to you. Uh, so Ryan, it looks like we did good. Um, the aero seal was done in October of 2018. So that winner got all the benefits. And I got to tell you, it was, it was, it was, my wife thinks I'm weird anyway, but it was awesome. To see that air coming through, that comf oh, it was great, huge impact. Um, so then we put in, um, I didn't add this, I should have. This is about when we put in the heat pump. So if you look at these two graphs, look at the difference in the natural gas usage. So um, th this is kind of the exciting part because the natural gas usage went way down. So we had a hundred therm reduction in usage. And this, this is the big, to, to me, the big exciting number. What I did is I took out the baseline gas that we use because we still have the natural gas uh, for the dryer and the oven and the water heater. So I still got work to do. So I took out, basically I calculated the average and I stripped that out. So to leave what was just covering the heat. 
we got 90% of that heat from the heat pump. I don't know. I was pretty excited about that. So when you think about, hey, can we use heat pumps in this area? Heck yeah. I got 90% uh, from my heat pump. So that was awesome. By doing that, we avoided, you know, more than 9,000 pounds of CO2. Now it took more electricity. So about 3,100 kilowatt hours more of electricity to operate that. And if I didn't have solar, that would have cost me, I, I just calculated the average retail rate, would have cost me some more money. Um, but that's a lot of CO2 we saved. That's a lot of cash saving on gas to help support that oversizing. I'm, not, I'm really glad that I oversized. Now, I did kind of, I had a pretty busy uh, February, March, and April, and that where it got really cold, you know, all the issues down in Texas, um, the price, it was impacting the price here. I'm on hourly pricing. So when it was getting, when they were forecasting it was going to be really cold, I flipped it over to just run on the furnace. And then unfortunately, I got really busy. I forgot about it. So it was running on a furnace for about half the month. Um, so that's what, that's, that's what this spike is right here is I forgot to put it on automatic switch. So you can set it to cool. You can set it to heat. You can set it to heat automatically with the heat pump and it'll switch between furnace. You can set it heat only with the furnace, heat only with the heat pump. You have all that flexibility with the system. Um, and I just forgot to turn it back to automatic. Um, so that was my bad. But hopefully, to me, this is the big, the big thing here. You can heat your homes in Chicagoland. So that means if you're up in Rockford, you can heat it there too. You can provide most of your heat with a heat pump. Now, the caveat is think about all those things. The building envelope, if you have forced air, make sure you seal your ducts. There's all those things that are important. But if you do those things, you can heat with your home with a heat pump and you can cool your home with a heat pump. That's kind of the easy part. So think about the cooling impact. Now here, you know, it's, it's an air conditioner, just like an air conditioner, but this one just happened to be more efficient. So the thing I want to point out here is that if you look at the typical, you can see the, the peak here in July, you can see it dropped uh, from here to here. And I uh, had about a 22% reduction in energy from May to August comparing those two years. And I know there's a question about, um, uh, if you have solar, I just wanted to point out, if you have solar on your roof and you filled your roof, uh, don't let this stop you, you know, from going to heat pump because if you haven't get a heat pump or electric car or something, um, you can go to community solar and make sure that power is supplied by solar energy. So it impacted my electricity as well. It's much more efficient. The overall comfort in the house uh, is good. So just to wrap things back up, there's the easy, there's the easy to moderate, and there's the difficult. So the HVAC part is the hardest part. It helps to think about it. Um, more than 80% of HVAC, and I would say also water heater, um, are emergency replacements. And so it's hard to go to a heat pump or to a hot heat pump water heater um, if it's an emergency, right? And that's why we have a fairly new water heater that's not, um, not electric. Um, community solar does not do hourly pricing. So you have to plan for this. So you don't have to have the same plans. I have I had a long 10 year plan, but it's do, for me, it was do a little bit at a time but you can electrify your home. I really hope that uh, after tonight, some of you will go, if you don't have an electric lawnmower, go out. If you need one, go out. The next time you need one, get one and explore looking at heat pumps. Um, make sure you look at the building envelope. And if you have duct work, the ducts that in sealing them, it's gonna uh, really help it be more uh, perform better. So that's what I have for today. Are there any other questions? I think you've answered most of the ones in the chat, um, but I guess this is your last call for anybody who has one uh, to type that in, uh, or you can 
your raise hand button and we can unmute you. Oh, I see Mike has changed to the slide about the Tesla raffle. This is uh, ISEA's big fundraiser every year. We raffle off a Tesla Model X and the one this year is ending on uh, this coming Monday. So it is your last chance to get a Tesla uh, possibly and support solar at the same time. Here is a link to that. Well, I do see another uh, another uh, question, Mike. Do you see it? It is about uh, heat pump water heaters. Yeah, I talked a little bit about it. Um, so I think placement's important. I, I know we have uh, some solar ambassadors that have, uh, w the last time we were going to look into it, we decided not to put it because our hot water heater is in the basement and it's already kind of cold down there and it's moving heat. It's not making heat. And so we saw a lot of issues with uh, people complaining about that situation. Um, so that's just something to consider. I know we have a, a solar ambassador out in Batavia that has one and he has kind of a split level house and he hasn't had an issue with that. Um, so I would encourage you to look about that, but think about it's moving heat from point A to point B, and it's got to get the heat from somewhere. So if it's in a cold basement, it may make that basement a little bit colder. So you may need to compensate with more flow from the furnace and so forth. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. We did consider geothermal. It was a lot more expensive and looking at the trade-offs, I'm like, we can get pretty close. And I didn't know for sure, but now I know we we could unplug the gas line because I could put in that electric heater in there and that would cover the other 10%. Um, and I could get solar to, to provide that electricity. So I'm pretty confident we could unplug the gas line. We're just not ready to do it yet. Geothermal, we looked at it and it was very expensive. The rebates are up to $6,000 from a ComEd, but we decided not to go that route. If we were going to build a new house, we'd, we'd go that route. Um, Yeah, the upfront cost is really high. The incentives are definitely better. Uh, we do have solar ambassadors that have geothermal and solar and EVs, and um, but for, for for us, it was it wasn't going to work out. Oh, okay. So uh, the hybrid water heater, Chuck. That looks excellent. So you can use the heat pump in summer and regular electric heater in winter. That's a great, that's great. That's excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Chuck. I have not looked into that option, but I'm going to have to do that because that sounds like it would, it would take care of the need in the summer. It would uh, help you cool. Outstanding. I see the ranch house and duck work in the basement. I don't see much advantage to ducks. Saying, oh, yeah, maybe not. Um, if you have, to me, if you have ducks, um, if they're going to leak, uh, then it'd be potentially advantage. For me, it it was a huge event. You saw some of the before and the after. It was a huge, uh, huge advantage. All right. So Jay also echoing that you can switch from heat heat pump mode to electric electric resistance. All right, any other questions? Um, that is all I'm seeing. Um, but thank you so much for an excellent presentation, Mike. And thank you everyone for uh, spending some time with us this evening. Uh, as a reminder, this will be going up on YouTube and I'll be sending it out as, uh, as a link in a follow-up email tomorrow. Um, thanks everyone and have a great rest of your evening. Thanks everybody. Go solar, go electric, yes. and have a great night.